Okay, chapter eight. Bam. We're halfway through this book. How do you feel about that? I got I got thumbs up from Jessica. That's it. Trina's halfway up. through means halfway done. Yeah, halfway through, halfway done. So what do you think of chapter eight? I'm just glad I read the right chapter. That's always a perk. Anybody else? It's not a very long chapter. I think chapter eight was an easy read. He was a little bit more clear with what he was trying to say. I didn't feel like I necessarily needed a degree to read this one, to read and understand. <laughs> Fair enough. Anybody else? No? All right. Well, let's begin. Um, chapter eight, it, it was really kind of single focused. And yeah, like you said, it was, it was a lot easier to read and it seemed like the theme was a lot easier to follow as well. He said something at the very beginning that was just meant to set up the chapter, but it certainly fits in our world today, especially the way COVID is. On page 123 and page 124, he said, communication theorists insist that for full human communication, you need not only words on a page, but also a tone of voice. That's why a telephone call can say more than a letter, not in quantity, but in quality. But for the full communication between human beings, you need not only a tone of voice, but also body language, facial language, and the thousand small ways in which, without realizing it, we relate to one another. Okay, talk to me about that. Do you agree with that? Do you disagree with that? Why? I agree with that because I think sometimes a text message or an email can be very easily misunderstood if you don't have the inflection that was meant behind the words or the, if you can't hear it being said, you don't know the tone in which it was meant. Yeah. I've learned a lot of times, like for me at work, I primarily deal with people by email just because it's easier to just shoot out a bunch of emails and not have to worry about the long drawn out conversation on a phone call. But I know that a lot of times it comes down to there are certain conversations I have to make a phone call so they can actually hear my voice as I'm saying it and understand, you know, kind of have the, the dialogue back and forth. And then even then sometimes I know that sometimes you have to turn around and go, I, this isn't even a phone call. I need to actually go visit the client and have this conversation face to face and make it more, where they can see everything, they can see you as you're having the conversation. Yeah, you would agree with that. I agree with that. I think it's very important for people to understand what you're saying and how you mean it to be said. And I think that comes with body language and tone of voice and actually just hearing someone rather than jotting down a text. Yeah, absolutely. That's the, the more, the more sen senses that we use when we communicate, the more clearly and the more effectively we communicate what we want to communicate, right? I mean, we could, we could do this meeting by typing. Y'all remember the last email board meeting we did? All right, our last, I don't even know what it was about, but how did that go? It went on for about six hours of back and forth like emails. Hours of emails. <laughs> At least six hours. <laughs> and I got no clue what was said. It was horrible. I think experience. it was. I think it was over approval for the for the loan, the ACCU loan. Yeah, it's ridiculously painful, right? Because it's one thing at a time and one person, but it could be done, right? So we can do it. We can communicate that way. Like there was a time when letter writing was the only way you communicated with people. It's a big deal. It's a lost art. It really is. But even more today, because we don't write so much, we, yeah, letter to Pergamon, right? Yeah, letter writing was a big deal. That's a great example, that book, Danny. Um, but then uh, the phone came in, right? And a phone call is so much more intimate because you can respond immediately. You, you can hear the inflection, right? If I just type the word shut up, I could mean a lot of things, right? I mean, wow, why is he being rude? Or you could say something like, shut up, right? That is totally different than shut up, even though they're the exact same word. 
you would receive both of those very differently. I tell you what, if I if I told Trina shut up, and I told her shut up, I'm gonna get two very different responses. One of them is gonna turn into a shiner. <laughs> you all guess which one, right? Okay. So then the phone call, but then the next best thing is to see faces. That's why when we do this, I always ask, get it on the video because that adds another sense, the visual, right? That, that helps us to see and to understand each other even more. And we know we're paying attention. We know we're there, right? So that part adds another section to it, but it's still, there, there seems to be nothing that's as good as being right there in person, talking and touching a person, right? Because sometimes you talk to somebody and, and, and you, you touch them and, and it, it adds to that. So there are lots of senses to the way that we talk. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. The reason I say all that is because the same is true when we read scripture. Actually, when we read anything, the more senses, the more dimensions we can apply to a message the better we can understand what's actually being said, right? If you just read the words, shut up, out of context, you could take that in a whole lot of different ways, right? But if it's right after somebody says something that's surprisingly good news, and you saw the word shut up explanation point, you might read it with that inflection, right? Shut up. But if, if someone's being loud and belligerent and you see shut up explanation point, you might hear shut up in an angry manner. The context starts to help. And then what also helps is understanding other things. What are other aspects of a letter? So let's say you come across a letter. What are some aspects of that letter that would help to determine how you read or might perceive what's being written? The greeting. The what? The greeting. How you right, explain that? Well, I, I, if you, you know, to whom it may concern, or dear so and so, or you, you know, it, it, how you address the person, kind of dictates the tone of the letter. Yeah. All right. So, if I start a letter, go ahead. Mm -hmm. No? All right. So if I start a letter, to whom it may concern, shut up, right? But if I, you not shut up, but I put to whom it may concern, and I write, um, I begin to write something in the body. What are you expecting in the body? What are you expecting to see? Something of a serious nature. Right. Serious nature, more professional. I usually started my um, my letters that of like intent of quitting my job to okay. that yeah. way. To Letter whom am I concerned? This is my two weeks' notice. Letter or, yeah, <laughs> yeah. We use that for like a generic professional statement, right? Yeah. We put no face on the person. We don't care what they know or don't know. What I'm about to say is pretty clear cut. To whom am I concerned? Uh, we wrote a letter when Sienna went to France, uh, giving permission for Claire to take her, you know, to another country. And so we began the letter with, to whom it may concern, which meant, don't read into this, nothing else. Basically, what I say here is just exactly what I'm saying. It's just generic. Don't look anymore. But if I begin it with something like, to my dearest beloved, then how does the tone of the letter change? Or does it? It takes on more personal aspect of the letter. Yeah, so even when you read it, even if it's not to you, but you read a love letter from one person to another that begins with, to my dearly beloved, you read it kind of with that consideration in mind. Okay, these two are in a close relationship, so whatever they write about means things about a close relationship. I was going to say it makes it more intimate. Makes it more intimate, yeah, absolutely. It's kind of like I've been reading the lost letters and in the beginning, a lot of the letters, he starts off by saying, you know, like my dearest, my friend dearest or, friend or to Luke benefactor, blah, blah, blah. And friend and scholar, like, and to Antipas benefactor of the people kind of gives yeah. you an idea of what the greetings change, don't they? Yes, they do. Yeah. 
as, as they grow in relationship, the greetings change. And they do with all of us. As we grow in relationships, the greetings change. But what about if we were to see a handwritten letter in, in a very fancy cursive? And we saw one that was typed on a piece of paper, but both of them said the same thing. What kind of differences might you read in them? The handwritten one took more time and they put more thought and energy into it. Whereas the typed out one is just a quick, like, let me shoot this out on the computer real quick. Okay. Yeah. So handwritten is more personal. Might even date it some, right? I mean, who uses a, who handwrites in cursive? That's, that wasn't Kyle. So I say all these things because even as we read the scripture, this is why I keep pressing on us to understand all the context. It changes the way we read it. The more we know about it, every dimension that we add to what was actually there changes the way we are to, we will perceive what we read. If we just hand somebody the gospel of Luke, for example, and we tell them, here you go, here's a letter. They've never heard of God, the Bible, or anything. You say, here, read this. And they read the gospel of Luke. They have no idea when it took place or anything. It might be very confusing for them. And they're like, this is weird. I mean, I, I don't get this. Why would this happen? Why would anyone treat anybody this way? And to be fair, if we were to read it and to look at it from today's context, it's going to do the same thing to us. But if we were to read it and put it properly and understand all the different contexts about it, the history, the socio-political, the eco economics political um, or socioeconomic standpoints, the guy who wrote the letter, who he's writing it to, it should change these nuances, should change the way we read it and understand it. Does that make sense? Okay. So that being said, the way the scriptures get read even today causes us often to read them improperly or to impose into them. Someone tells me, hey, this letter says this already. When I read it, I'm going in there with this biased opinion that this is what it says, and that's what I'm going to read out of it. If someone says, here, see what they wrote here? This person's mean. They told me to shut up. They're a horrible, angry person, and I'm going to read it and believe that. They wrote, shut up, exclamation point. What a horrible statement. But maybe I'm reading it out of context, and they heard good news, and they're just shut up. And they're actually happy, and they're joining in celebration, right? So we have to understand it that way. Okay. So he goes right into Jesus' second coming. What does he say about Jesus and what Jesus says about his own second coming? I don't understand the part he talks about with the parable of this, the, um, the servants and the, I forgot what it was, they, where they, one of them buries the uh, money in a napkin instead of investing it. The parable of the talents, yeah. Yeah. I don't understand that part, how he says that that was Jesus talking about not his second coming, but about his first coming. Yeah. That one doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me, because wasn't that the whole thing of Jesus saying to spread your faith and whatnot and all this and that? But it kind of almost seems like, why would he say that as a parable as saying, well, this is what you should have been doing before I came. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. It seems like it would make more sense for him to be saying, this is what you need to do. Jesus wasn't one to tell, tell people that they did things wrong and that what they did and kind of focus on their past errors. It seems like he was more of a, this is what you need to be doing now and going forward. So I don't know if that makes any sense to you. That makes a lot of sense. How many others had some issues with those those two points that he put out? I, I did. I'm, I'm not sure I, I entirely agree with him on it, to be honest with you, on, on especially the first one. That one I could I could understand a little more. The first one I was really pushing back on. Oh, I'm, I'm not sure I'm there, but to be fair, he, he does say I, I set up the whole case for this in a previous writing. I don't have I don't have room to put it here. Okay, maybe you did, but I haven't seen that writing and read it, so I don't I don't know where you're going with this. I'm not sure that I agree with it or not. So um, I put those down here. Let's talk about those. The first one, we'll get to your second, Dan, Danny, since um, you put these in order. The first one thing he said, well, he says Jesus didn't mention his second coming. And so at least that's his, his um, claim. Jesus doesn't talk about his second coming. So the first thing that he does, Jesus talks about the Son of Man coming in the clouds. Now, you guys know those references that he's making? 
When Jesus says in, oh, Matthew chapter 24, Mark 13, and I believe Luke, oh, let me find it here. So, I got a question. Sure. Can you clarify? Yeah. Um, okay, well, he says, where he says that Jesus never said anything about his return, isn't where, isn't where in John where he says, um, if I go prepare a place for you, am I, am I throwing that all out of context? No, I see where you're going. Um, and even in that passage, though, the way we read it is he's talking about him going to prepare a place that we'll go to, whatever that looks like, preparing this kingdom, whether he's going to bring it here or whatnot. But it doesn't actually talk about his return. So he says, would I not go prepare? But I, I, I see what you're saying, Luke. I think that's a valid, um, definitely a valid, valid one. That's John um, 14, I believe. Yeah, John 14, 1, 3, 3. Yeah, so let's look at it. Let's go there. Let me share screen. Da -da -ba -ba. All right. Here we go. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. If I were, if it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also, and you know the way to the place I am going. So, yeah, Lupe, I'd say that was definitely uh, talking about his second coming, or, you know, at least his coming in some sense. Um, bringing him to him. I think this would fit in though with the one he talked about before with, with the coming to God, coming to the place. But yeah, this is definitely a passage that I would argue speaks to his second coming. So yeah, good catch. I got to agree with Lupe on that. Cause even when you read it, it says I will come again and I will take you myself. So kind of hard not to see that there. Yeah. 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 No, I agree. So I'd be interested to see how he deals with that passage. Like I said, I'm not entirely, I, I, you know, I see some, some, um, I see merit to his argument. I, I do, but I'm not convinced by, by any, any means on, on this part of it. I think it kind of almost seems like his point isn't necessarily that it's not discussed, but more that it's not a priority. That Jesus could second with. coming is definitely not a priority in the gospel or in Jesus' teachings. It's about more other stuff, really. It, I, I agree wholeheartedly. In fact, anytime they ask Jesus about it, it's like, don't worry about that. We have other things. So it's like, you guys keep talking about the wrong thing. So, yeah, I, I agree with that. Well, I mean, how much of that, how much of that, um, that second coming, that foretelling that Jesus is talking about is just having to do with coming itself and not after that you, you know what i mean it's just he says he's gonna come back well apparently he did well you know what i mean so i mean now we read a lot into it whereas before they wouldn't have read as much into it that's fair that's fair too and there's the other thing that the pastor josh pointed out you have to remember when they wrote this you know when these things were said when jesus said this not even when this was written when Jesus said this to the people, he hadn't died and resurrected yet. Where are you going that you're going to come back? And so to be fair, he died, and he did come back at the resurrection, right? So it, it could fit in there as well. The passage that he really points to is the Son of Man coming on the clouds. He says that he references Daniel in Daniel chapter 7. How many of you went back to... See Daniel chapter 7 to see what he's talking about. Nobody? I'm the only one who read Daniel chapter 7 to see what was going on here? That's okay. We can read Daniel chapter 7 together. So let's go to Daniel chapter 7. So this is where Daniel has this weird vision during the reign of King Belshazzar. And um, he sees this beast coming up out of the, out of the sea. And he sees a, a, a what does it say? Four great beasts come out of the sea, different from each other. The first was like a lion. It had eagle's wings. Then I watched. Its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a human being. And a human mind was given to it. Another beast appeared, a second one, that looked like a bear. It was 
raised up on one side, had three tusks in its mouth among its teeth, and was told, Arise, devour many bodies. After this, I watched, and another appeared like a leopard. The beast had four wings of a bird on its back and four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this, I saw in visions by night a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth and was devouring, breaking in pieces, and stamping what was left with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that preceded it, and it had ten horns. I was considering the horns when another horn appeared, a little one, coming up among them to make room for it. Three of the earlier horns were plucked up by its roots. There were eyes like human eyes in this horn and a mouth speaking arrogantly. Okay, so he has this weird image, right, that we're like, we're reading Daniel, we're reading Revelation here, right? It's weird stuff. So Daniel, Daniel has one of the more famous apocalyptic visions. And this vision, this first part to be short, to be short here, is concerns the Persian Empire, the Babylonian Empire, and basically the Greek Empire, the Macedonian um, conquering by, by uh, Philip of Macedonia and then by his son, um, Alexander the Great. So that, that's kind of what he's talking about here. These are the things that are going to happen. Those things came to be like he said. So this is a, another sign of, you know, this chaos, all this war is happening. But then he says, as I watched, thrones were set in place, and an ancient one took his throne. So who do you think an ancient one is? Who's he referring to? God. God, yeah. Okay, so in the Old Testament, when you, you know, read this this time, and you read it, you think, okay, he's talking about Yahweh. He's the ancient one. An ancient one took his throne. His clothing was white as snow. His hair, the hair of his head, like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, and its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and flowed out from his presence. A thousand thousand served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood attending him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were open. I watched it. Okay, so the court sat in judgment, and the books were open. So what is that? What kind of language does that sound like? What's happening here? Judgment. He's got a judgment, right? So he's on the throne, court's in order, there's about to be some kind of judgment. He says, I watched then because of the noise of the arrogant words that the horn was speaking. And as I watched, the beast was put to death and its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. As I watched in the night visions, I saw one like a human being coming with the clouds of heaven. And he came to the ancient one and was presented before him. So the New Testament, when Jesus says in all three synoptic gospels, and they will see the Son of Man coming. I don't think I have. They'll see the Son of Man coming. Any person who hears Jesus, a Jewish rabbi, mention this. They're going to think about something particular. It's going to be like this. If I make a mention to you guys, I stand at the pulpit and I tell you guys, we are going to talk. Oh, wait, um, I say, the times are very bad these days. Prepare yourselves to see the four horsemen. What would you guys think I was referencing? Would you understand that reference? Yeah, you'd, you'd be thinking, oh, he's, he's about to be getting into some apocalyptic revelation stuff. He's talking about the four horsemen. We know that. That, that catches our ears immediately. In the exact same way, a Jewish rabbi speaking to people says, coming on clouds of heaven, they're immediately going to be thinking like the four horsemen. He's talking about Daniel 7. I saw one like a human being coming with the clouds of heaven. So he's, he's comparing himself to this person right here. And where did it, what happened when he was in the clouds of heaven? Where did he go? What does Daniel say? He came to the ancient one and was presented before him. Every Jew would know this. He's talking when he says clouds of heaven. He's Jesus comparing himself to Daniel. And in Daniel, when he says clouds of heaven is coming, where is it coming to? Let me rephrase the question. When we hear, when we simply say, hey, a cloud from heaven is coming, tell me where that cloud is started. Based on that thing, where do you think that cloud starts? Sounds like it starts in heaven. That makes sense, right? Starts in heaven. It's a cloud of heaven. And if it says it's coming, then where does that mean it's heading to? What's its, what's its 
where's where's the where's the trajectory here? To Earth. To Earth, because we think of us. If it's coming, so it's coming to me. So we automatically read that we think he's coming on clouds of heaven. He's coming. But if I'm a Jew in the first century, and I hear some Jewish rabbi talk about this, the coming, I'm thinking of Daniel 7. And remember, Daniel's thinking of this image. And he says, and there was, there was the ancient one seated on the throne. So imagine that away from you. And he says, and then I saw a cloud coming, but it's not coming to me. It's coming to what? Where does he say it's coming to? To the ancient one. God. To the ancient one. Right. So Jesus uses the reference, but nobody would think that he's coming to them. They would realize he's coming to God. And he was presented before him. And so Jesus is talking about he's going to die. He's going to be resurrected. And when he dies and he's resurrected, what happens afterwards? What's the next fancy word? After 40 days, he is, or 50, yeah, after 40 days, he ascends. And where does he ascend to? To heaven. Heaven. Specifically, heaven. where does he ascend to? To the right hand of the Father. To the right hand of the Father, fulfilling this. So when he says, I'm coming on clouds, he wasn't talking to, he's not talking to us. He didn't say, hey, write this down as a prophecy to the future. You got to remember the synoptic gospels, they're recording what happened in the past. They're telling a story, a narrative, not a prophetic vision. They're saying, and this is what Jesus told them people, not you, not me, not nobody today. He told them people. And so when he told them people, them people heard that as, He's fulfilling Daniel 7. How is he going to do that? And when he dies and he ascends to the right hand of the Father, he perfectly fulfills Daniel 7. And so in that capacity, N.T. Wright has a pretty good case. He's not talking about his second coming the way we think about it. He's talking about right now his first coming, and he's calming people because he's going to leave, and he's going to where he needs to go. Does that make sense? All right, I'm going to give you guys a second to uh, throw me your two cents or three cents. Actually, throw me a buck because we have a change shortage. We don't have time to be throwing change around. <laughs> Any thoughts about that? I think before I read this chapter, I would have interpreted that as coming down to earth. But after reading this chapter, going through and looking at that and looking at the other points he made, it it was easy to understand what he was trying to say and how interpretations can be so misunderstood sometimes. Yeah. And to be fair, until I read this chapter, I was exactly with you, Jessica. It was the first time I read that. I was like, it's not wrong. I went and read Daniel 7. I'm like, I got to go see what he's saying here because I don't believe him. And I read Daniel 7. I thought, he's not wrong. i had been thinking of myself. I'm reading it and that's what it means to me. But this isn't a prophetic letter. It's, a, a documented narrative, if you will. Anybody else? So that does mean that we need to go back and reevaluate how we read the rest of those passages. He's talking to people about present tense, their present tense. Now, it still has hope for us. There's a lot to us. This, this should be encouraging to us. He is the fulfillment of these prophecies. We should also get excited when, when the Bible starts to make more sense, especially weird stuff like Daniel 7, because that book is, Revelation's easier to understand, I think, than Daniel. I, I really do. But whatever, right? Daniel, it was a long time ago. Okay, then his second one. He says that Jesus wasn't talking about his second return, but he was partic pointing to this particular coming this first one when he talked about the the parable of the talents right is that the one that he did Danny okay so here's the parable of the talents that he he addresses in there and what's he doing here so he's telling a bunch of parables here and he's talking about the kingdom of heaven he says for it is as if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them to one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. 
The one who received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with him. Then the one who received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed, me over, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And then the one with two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow, and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, have what is yours. But his master replied, You wicked and lazy slave. You knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow, and gather where I did not scatter. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have received Receive what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with ten talents. For all those who have will be given, and those who have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. For the, as for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Okay. When we hear that, what do we normally think? Tell me your, your interpretation. Your, what we normal, how we normally interpret that. So when I read it, I think of like, here's your, it, it would be like Jesus giving you your faith and then you go and spreading it and spreading the good news and getting more followers. And he's saying, you know, you went and you spread it and you gathered more followers. So well done, you did good. But then to the one who only had one who didn't do anything, he, he didn't go and spread his faith, so he didn't do what he was supposed to do, and he wasn't good and faithful. So I've been taught, and it makes sense. And to be fair, even if Wright's interpretation of this is right, that's still applicable. The, the, the principle would still apply no matter what. But what Wright's trying to say is, he's going back to remember the audience. This isn't... Matthew telling a story of prophetic visions that Jesus has. He's telling us what Jesus said to Jews, to people, in the first, while he was walking around, before he was crucified, before anybody had any notion he was going to be crucified. No one, no one that he's talking to had any imagination he's going to be crucified, that he's going to leave, and he's going to come back. That was not even on their mind. There's no reason for Jesus to come back. He's never leaving. So they don't have a, 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 an understanding of a second coming. So unless he says a second coming, they have no concept of it. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? We think it does that, now, but it, it, it didn't click. At, when I, I read this a million times, and it never did click until right now. And it, it, it's, I am reading it in the present instead yeah. of who it was intended for. And the part where I, I just don't know if it's ever been literal or what is he saying when he said, go into the darkness where there will be uh, weeping and gnashing of teeth. What is that literal? Is that the hell that's literal? I, I want to say yes. Um, yes and no, but mostly yes. I love what Adrian Rogers used to say. I don't know if the fire and brimstone are, are literal, but I believe that the weeping and gnashing of teeth are, in that whatever hell is, it will lead to the weeping and gnashing of teeth. Um, so this, while he doesn't say hell here, this thing, throw him into the outer darkness. Darkness. What, what is the outer darkness? So if I'm a Jew, remember, what's the worst thing that can happen to a Jew? Outside of the community. Outside of the community. And where is outside of the community, literally? Outside of the temple. And outside in the of the gates. Outside of the gates of the city. 
And in the city, is it like you're outside of the city, you know, outside the city limits, the outer limits? There's a wall there. Why is there a wall around a city? Protection. And why would you need protection? Um, State the office. Yeah. Why do you need protection? Um, from other people coming yeah. to try to contact There's bad guys them. out there. Right. And man, nighttime comes, what happens? I'm out there alone. There's no night lights out there. <laughs> You're out there in the darkness, and it's scary, right? And there's yeah. weeping, there's gnashing of teeth out there. There's this man I'm separated from the community. Remember, for a Jew, the ultimate, I mean, the ultimate thing is being cast out of the community, being separated from being the people of God. And so the way N.T. Wright lays this out, he says, look, Jesus is not talking about his second coming here, at least not to these people. They're not hearing this going, okay, so when you come back, Jesus, nobody says those words, remember? Because I'm not saying that Jesus isn't going anywhere. Why would he come back? So he's telling them about the kingdom, what it's like. He says, you know, I mean, think about this. He says, a man going on a journey summons his slaves and entrusted property to them. Who's the man that goes on a journey? It's God, right? It's God. And he entrusts his people with this. He's, Take care of the temple. Do this thing. And he gives them all the stuff. Take you. Priests, do this. The Levites, do this. The, the, the lay people, do this. All of you, do this. And when he comes back, some of them did it. Some of them did a great job. But some of them were so busy trying to protect God's word, that they did nothing with it. And to be fair, this is exactly what the Pharisee had done. They were created to protect God's word. And they did nothing with it. And so God says, you worthless people. I mean, you did nothing. You could give it to bankers. You could have given it to people who are only in it for profit. They would have done a better job than you. So when the first century people hear this from Jesus live, it may be that they're hearing Jesus kind of speaking against the second temple people and the way they've acted, waiting for the Messiah to come. I mean, this is about when the Messiah thing started, was during the second temple. God kind of disappears. We don't hear any more prophetic words. But the, the, the Messiah, that prophecy is what's holding them together. And then here he is. He's returned. The Messiah is here. Wow. And they haven't done anything. And worse than that, how do they treat the Messiah? The same the way they treated all the prophets. Yeah, right. So Jesus says, for this worthless slave, throw him out in the outer darkness. You're going to be cut off from the kingdom because you didn't do anything like I told you to do. So I, I see where he's right there, but I still, I'm not convinced. I mean, I'm, I'm going to go back and have to go read some books. I feel like out of context that the parable makes sense in what he's, what N.T. Wright's saying it, it, it's about. I just feel like it doesn't fit with Jesus's typical parables. And the concept of basically this whole story, this parable is leaning towards him saying that you guys did wrong by God over the last hundreds of years. And he does, if Jesus' parables don't tend to lean that way. They tend to lean more towards this is what you should be doing more, more towards the future and towards the present, not the error of their past ways. Okay. That makes sense. It does. I see where you're going. I think it'd be interesting to go back and do even just chapter 24 and kind of do a study of this. Because I, I do believe that a lot of this, he's talking about how they failed getting ready for the Messiah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I see where you're coming from. It, it would be, um, I think that's a great study we should do sometime. Kind of go back and look at those and put them in context. Because to be fair, we're, we're doing this in a reading. You know, we each read the chapter probably in a day. Most of us probably read it today. And so we're like, okay, now we've got this. This guy has already put 40 years behind this thought. So we got some catching up to do to see where he's at, right? But yeah, I'm with you. I'm still, I'm not convinced. I'm not going to just jump on there because he says so. I mean, I respect his opinion, but I'm, I'm going to have to dig some more into it. I can see it. Like I said, they're definitely plausible. There's merit to his arguments. And, and I'm going to say the first one has much more merit than the second one does. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but how do you guys feel about it? It's all right if you disagree or agree or what. Then he starts talking about the parousia. 
Who's heard of the paralysia? What is the no, paralysia? Okay. Go ahead, Lupe. No, I just read about it. So I haven't heard of it before that. Okay. No, I had neither. The paralysia is kind of an important, um, important word, important concept. And T. Wright says that the parousia itself is one of those terms in which Paul is able to say that Jesus is the reality of which Caesar is the parody. His theology of the second coming is part of his political theology of Jesus as Lord. So while Wright says that, you know, in the, in the Gospels, Jesus isn't talking about his second coming because he hasn't died yet. So no one's, they, they wouldn't notice. So why are you talking about a second coming? You're going somewhere, right? Once he dies and he's ascended to heaven, Acts immediately kind of pushes this. I mean, they're all, be prepared for the return of the Lord, right? And then Paul is basically all about the second coming. The, the day is coming. The time is coming. The morning is approaching. The dawn is preparing. Clothe yourselves as children of the day, not children of the light, night. Right? This is, this is like the biggest thing that Paul's kind of into. And he talks about the parousia, the presence of Christ. Why would the parousia be important? What is the importance of the presence of Christ? It's kind of funny because it sounds like he's basically saying in here that him using that word in Greek was basically an intentional political dig at Caesar, saying that this isn't your special presence, it's God's and Jesus' presence. Or coming for that matter. Yeah, absolutely. You nailed what he said there. That's exactly what he's trying to do. So, Paul, especially if you read the um, letters to Pergamum, you might even understand more so. Or um, even if you, if you read Phoebe. Did any of you guys read Phoebe? I have your book on Phoebe, and I, I, I'm in the middle of it. Okay. If you're in the middle, you've probably even gotten enough to start to see some of the, yeah. the way yeah. things are in Rome, right? The way they were. I mean, her story is crazy the way they did it's amazing. it. Amazing. Melissa read it also. So if you read that, what you understand also is Paul, in every one of his letters, Paul is always taking jabs at the government. He is regularly poking at, at Rome and at Caesar and at the government. He's trying to get people to stop leaning on them for everything. And why, why would he have to do that? What's happening in first century Rome that might call, cause Paul, Paul to always try to get the people to, to try to push against the people leaning on the government? Because the church is supposed to take care of the people. First off, it's the church will take care of people. That's the church's job. And we hear that a lot today. And people are saying, yeah, you know, we got to, Governments not take, you know, they got welfare all messed up and health care is all messed up and they're messing all this stuff up. And it bothers me when I hear that from Christians. I'm like, well, uh, it's not their job to do it. That's actually our job. But as a church, we pawned it off. We have subcontracted what God called us to do to the government, thinking if we just vote the right people in there, then it's going to take care of poverty and it'll take care of welfare and health care and, and, and all these other things. We're just going to pawn it off to the government to make sure we get the right people to run it. And Paul says, don't ever do that. And yet, that is our, that is our MO. What else? Why else would he be poking at Rome or telling people? Wasn't no. at the time when he wrote it, the persecution of the early Christians and all of the, I mean, a lot of it was trying to get the Christians or people on the Christian side instead of on the Roman side to try and back the Christians instead of allowing the Romans to continue to persecute and chase them out. Yeah, there was definitely some persecution against the Christians, especially because of the statement, because Christians were, by their nature, opposed to the Roman government. They are against the government, and, and, and maybe that's not the way to put it. They, they are separated from the government. They want nothing to do with the government. They don't believe the government has any power to help them or to hurt them. And they believe that to lean on them is idolatry. Y'all remember the Pax Romana? Right? The Roman peace? 
-hmm. People were taught, you know, you lean on the government. The government brings us peace. The government provides for us. The government's how we make sure that we have our standard of living, our ethics, everything else is done through the government, through policies. And we have to make sure that we are just absolutely honoring the government, honoring Rome. So much so that we, we, we throw our incense in the air every day. You begin the day in the schools and, and whatnot, and you throw the incense in honor of Rome, right? Rome is first and foremost. And if you're to worship God, you would have that eagle in the sanctuary where you worship God. And Paul says, we don't do that. We don't mix Rome with God. And so, yeah, the parousia is him intentionally taking a jab, making a parody of Rome, saying the government is a joke. The government thinks it's their presence here that's doing that. We await the parousia of Christ. He's the king, not Caesar. This is his kingdom, not Rome's. Jesus brings peace, not the government and the military strength. The church are the ones that do the work of Christ, not the government, and nor are government leaders. So that's why he says it's one of those terms which Paul's able to say that Jesus is the reality of which Caesar is the parody. And it's a really good statement, especially as we get back into the Revelation study. Bear that in mind, that in Revelation, John does the same thing. He's going out of his way to show that Jesus is the reality of which Rome is the parody, and it is failing miserably as the parody. Oh, he said, especially when we go to Philippians 3.20. Let's go to Philippians 3.20 real quick. Let's see. Let's see what Paul has to say here. Brothers and sisters, beginning in 17. Brother and sister, join in imitating me and observe those who live according to the, to the example you have in us. For many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. I've often told you of them, and now I tell you with tears. Their end is destruction. Their God is the belly, and their glory is in their shame. Their minds are set on earthly things. Okay, now let's stop for a second before we get to 20. So for those who read um, either letters or Phoebe, their glory is in their shame. Tell me what kind of a jab that is at the Roman culture. A lot of the people that were supposed to be considered honorable were shaming the lower ones in order to become more honorable. Yeah. They live in a shame culture, an honor-shame culture. And if you are high in honor, you shame others. That's, that's okay. That's acceptable. It's how you do it then. They're expected to do that. He says, but then, man, they... These people who follow the government, these people who, who live the way of the nation, were so proud of their nation, their, their glory is in their shame because their minds are on what? Earthly things. They're thinking just on this thing separated from the spirit. But our citizenship is in heaven. And it's from there that we're expecting a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So here's another one to put in context. I've often read, but our citizenship is heaven. And, and what do you think that would mean to your average person if you told them, my citizenship is in heaven? Well, tell me about that. What does that mean? It's, it's future, right? I, I mean, when you just read it out of context without, without thought, it, it's a future heaven. Yeah, okay. when I, I'm not worried because when I die, I'm gone. I'm going to heaven. That's where my citizenship is. Right? And that is how most Christians read this. When I die, I'm going to heaven. That's my citizenship. My citizenship is in heaven. But Paul's talking about here and now. He's talking about what's happening to people now. He says, look, you do this now because your citizenship right now, right now, your citizenship is in heaven. And if I'm a citizen of heaven, then who should I be loyal to right now? God. I'm loyal to God. I do what God says. He's my king. Not Caesar. Right. And where is God's kingdom? Here and now. Man, here and now. If I'm a citizenship of God in heaven, this is kingdom. I'm going to do what he says here and now. I'm going to do what he says here and now. And it is from there that we're expecting a savior. So I'm expecting a savior. Now, now we can put ourselves in that in false position. If I'm Paul, I'm saying I'm expecting a savior or we're expecting a savior. We're expecting that to come here, right? We're expecting the savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he'll transform the body of our humiliation so it can be conformed to the body of his glory 
by the power that also enables him to make all things subject to himself. So he's saying, right now we're citizens of heaven. We don't, we don't bow down to Rome. We don't play the, the imperial cult or the, the national religion. We participate in what God says, and we rely on God. Now, we do like Paul has said in other places. As best we can, we live at peace with others, right? As best we can in this church, we're going to live at peace with the government. The government says, hey, worship outside. You can't worship inside. I'm not going to intentionally poke a bear. i got no reason to. I can worship outside as easy as I can worship inside. But if they get to a point where they say you're no longer ever allowed to worship at all, I don't, I don't, I'm not a citizen of you. I don't, I'm not going to listen to you. I'm going to listen to God. We're going to worship. We're going to do everything we can to be at peace. But mind you, we're going to worship God. And we're going to do what God tells us to do. Does that make sense? And then he talks about the rapture in Thessalonians. Dun, dun, dun. So on page 134, let's just go there. Where are we at here? 133. Thank you. Oh, yeah, there it is. Ah. Okay. Note, though, something else of great significance about the whole Christian theology of resurrection, ascension, second coming, and hope. This theology was born out of confrontation with the political authorities out of the conviction that Jesus was already the true Lord of the world who would one day be manifested as such. The rapture theology avoids this confrontation because it suggests that Christians will be miraculously removed from this wicked world. Perhaps that's why such theology is often Gnostic in its tendency towards private, dualistic spirituality and towards a political laissez-faire quietism. And perhaps that is partly why such theology, with its dreams of Armageddon, has quietly supported the political status quo in a way that Paul would never have done. So let's go to 1 Thessalonians 4, and then let's talk about what he said there. Screen share. All right. See it? So let's, let's read this real quick. Finally, brothers and sisters, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus, as you learn from us how you ought to live and, and to please God, as in fact you are doing, you should do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from fornication, that each of you know how to control your own body in holiness and honor, not with lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one wrong or that no one wrong or exploit a brother or sister in this matter, because the Lord is an avenger in all these things. Just as we have already told you beforehand and solemnly warned you, for God did not call us to impurity, but to holiness. Therefore, whoever rejects this rejects not human authority, but God, who also gives his Holy Spirit to you. Now, the concerning, uh, the concerning love of the brothers and sisters, you don't need to have anyone write to you. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. And indeed, you do love all the brothers and sisters throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, beloved, to do so more and more, to aspire to live quietly, to mind your own affairs, to work with your hands as we've directed you, so you may behave properly towards the outsiders and be dependent on no one. But we don't want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who died. So you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God, Will bring, him, will bring with him those who died. For this we declare to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will by no means precede those who died. So stop for just a second here. He's trying to comfort them because they've had some of them die. They thought he's already come back. They died. They're, they're, they're gone forever. He said, calm down. Your friends and family that are gone, they're, they're not lost. We're okay with this. Jesus hasn't come back yet. When he comes back, we who have, um, we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, we will by no means precede those who died. For the Lord himself, with the cry of command, with the archangel's call, and with the sound of God's trumpet, will descend from heaven, and the dead in Christ will rise first, and we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up in the clouds together with them to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. 
Now, this passage has often been used to say we're going to get caught up in the air, and that's where we're going to be with God forever. So, so I was talking to um to someone this, this last week about this. I said, well, yeah, we don't add anything to Scripture. And I was explaining to him, we, we all add something to Scripture. We don't realize it, but we do it. So this is a great example. When you read Scripture here, it says Jesus is going to come down, right? What does it say? He He's coming to us from heaven. He descends from heaven. And then what happens? What does the scripture say happen next? That the dead will meet him. So the dead will rise first. And then what? Right. And then those left behind. And then those who are alive, who are left, they're going to be mm -hmm. caught up in the clouds together to meet with the Lord in the air. So we're going to be with the Lord forever. So I said, okay, so now what? Where, where do we go from here? We're in mid-space. God's come down. He's in mid-air in the clouds. What's that? About 30,000 feet. We caught up with him at 30,000 feet. And so we're going to stay right there at 30,000 feet forever? No. But what do we imply? We automatically assume, well, yeah, we're going back to heaven. What's that's coming? not what it says here at all. It's not even what it means to imply, but even that part we add. We automatically add something. Well, it just makes sense that we would keep going with our momentum. Think about how how um, arrogant it is of us. Our momentum going upwards, of course, is the momentum that would keep going. It's all about us. But wouldn't Jesus' momentum coming downward be a little more important than our momentum going upwards? Yeah. <laughs> He also says, and N.T. Wright's correct in this, people read this, they know what he's talking about. When someone's coming into a city, what do you do when you see the king coming over the hill? Read them. You, you read go them. out to meet them. You run right. out to meet them. They don't just sit there and be like, oh, God's here. Hey, someone catch the gate for him. Make sure it's unlocked. Tell him to take your shoes off before he comes in. Of course not. You run out to greet the king, and then what do you do? Bring him inside with you. You escort him in. Come on in, come on in. We, we do this today. Most of us do it in the foyer. I remember when Trina went to Africa, and she was gone for a month. Oh, my goodness, it was painful. I love my kids, but if I'm left with them for a month again, I'm giving them all away <laughs> for everybody's benefit. She came back. She couldn't get out of the foyer for 30 minutes. Why? Kids came and attacked her. Isaac just, oh, my And then they want to show, come in, come in, come in. Let us show you what you got, right? You invite them in, come in, come in. We greet people at the door, and then we tell them, come in, come in. And so this is what's happening here. But. If God's coming here and it's about this here, and then the kingdom says that we shouldn't, he says um, in Philippians that we are to, to, to bow down to them, but to trust in Christ because our citizenship is with Christ, we need to act differently here. But if I'm leaving, it's a whole lot easier to say, you know what, government, you take care of this. I'm not too worried because in the end, he's coming, we're all leaving anyway. That's exactly what happens. It's happening in America today. Most Christians are content with the government doing our job. Look at how much stock Christians put into government and politics. And it's important. I think it's important to vote, to vote ethically. But at the end of the day, I'll be honest with you, my personal thoughts are, I don't really care who's president. I don't care who runs our country. I hope they run it well, I do. But at the end of the day, I'm still going to do what God called me to do the same way. It won't affect me. It won't affect how I feel, how I treat homosexuals. It won't affect how I treat the poor. It won't affect how I treat anyone. It shouldn't. If who you have in government affects how you treat or how you act as a Christian, you're worshiping the wrong God. And if they get a government in there that says, we're shutting down the church, praise be to God. Good luck. They've tried it before. I'm going to do what God tells me to do. Now, obviously, I try to vote in ways that I hope that doesn't happen. I've been to the Who Scout. It's not that fun. 
But if I got to go again, I'll do it. And, and that's what Paul's saying. Stop putting so much stock in the government. They're not, they're not the peace. And Christ is coming back. Our citizenship's with him. And when he comes back, he better catch us worshiping him. So that if he does come and give, you know, we hear the parable of the talents. It's not, well, you know, we, we left it with the government. We just kind of held on to your laws and protected the church as best we could, Jesus. Be like, man, go outside where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. I expected you to reach people and to change this world. Okay. Anything else from chapter 8? I mean, it's a pretty short chapter. Give me your thoughts. Give me your pushback. Here's the thing for clarity, too, just so you guys know. In the Nazarene church, our eschatological stance, I love it. It's one of my favorites. We believe that Jesus Christ will return, that the dead will raise, be raised first, and then the living we will be caught up with Christ in the air. And we believe that he will, at that point, judge the living from the dead. And the living, the, judge the righteous from the unrighteous. Those who are found righteous will be in his presence forever. And those who are unrighteous will be cast into an eternal fire. That's it. As Nazarenes, it's perfectly acceptable to believe in, in rapture. It, it really is. I don't. It's perfectly acceptable to believe in a millennialism, pan millennialism, pre millennialism, whatever you want, it's just not our doctrine. We don't push it, we don't care. At the end of the day, Jesus is coming back and he's going to judge people. So I, I say that to let you know you don't have to actually just kind of jump on board with this. But as your pastor, I want to lead you hopefully to scriptures where you wrestle with these things and where you can make informed decisions for yourself based on the proper context of the scripture. Does that make sense? Are we okay? Well, Pastor, in light of what you just said, at the time of the judgment, when he separates the righteous from the unrighteous, that's who, that at that time is when you know if you're going to heaven or hell. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, you know if you're going to spend an eternity in the presence of Christ or an eternity away from Christ. Yes. But when is your name written in the book of life? No, oh, interesting. That's a great question. So, um, I would say that the short answer is that moment you truly do receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. I mean, that's, that's when you're written in the book of life, when I've given my life to Christ. When I say, he's my Lord and Savior, I'm a servant. My, my name is in the book of life. And I know that so then we know that before we before we're caught up in the class. Yeah, yeah. So I'm certainly I'm okay with it. I'm ready for Jesus to come back, right? I feel good about this. Yeah. yeah. So we can be confident. And that's one of the things we have to understand. We are Arminian in, in um in our theology. Do you guys know what that means to be Arminian? No. Okay. And uh, Methodists are Arminian also. It's very important to know that Methodists are very Arminian. Okay, because John Wesley was very Arminian. So there are basically two schools of thought um, theologically. There's Calvinism and Arminianism. You guys have heard of Calvinism probably, yes. right? You heard of the tulip doctrine, total depravity, um, um, unmerited, whatever. Anyway, so Calvin basically believed that God at the very beginning chose exactly what people from all of eternity were going to be saved and which ones weren't, and there's nothing you can do about it. So he's already elected who's going to get saved. We don't know. And so it should give you confidence that if you're saved, you're elected in the end. Because he elected you and it's all God, there's nothing you can do about it and you can't fall from grace. You're going to be saved. And once saved, you're always saved. You guys have heard that one, I'm sure, right? Once saved, always saved. I had a buddy tell me, dude, we do what we want. You're a Christian now. Once saved, always saved. That's just the stupidest thing I've ever heard. But whatever. Um, and so there are other things. Joseph Arminius, on the other hand, started to suggest that it's not how it worked, that God's grace was for everyone, wasn't limited to certain people, that God desired everyone to be saved, that everyone had that option to be saved, and to be fair, you could turn away from grace. And we know that because Romans 11 teaches that clearly, that if you were grafted into the tree, how much, how much more quickly will God cut out that which was grafted than that which was original? If we choose to continue to sin against God. 
So he, he's very clear. You can lose your salvation by sinning against God and, and, and walking away from him. And so we work in it. But I'm, I'm confident because the Holy Spirit seals me. I'm in the church and, and I can work through my salvation. And I can be confident when that day comes that my name is written in that book of life because my journey has been towards God. Father Theophan at the Orthodox Church had once told me kind of his view, the Orthodox view, which I really love. They're so close to, um, to Wesleyan theology. They're obviously Arminian as well, um, and at least Arminian-like in their belief. But he says, when you die, you're always moving. So in, in life, you're always moving. You're either moving towards God or away from God. And so when you die, whatever your momentum is, that is your momentum for eternity. And that's a pretty good way to look at it. I mean, if I die while I'm moving away from God, then for eternity, I will move further and further away from God. But if I'm moving towards God, if I'm working in my salvation in fear and trembling, if I'm trying to be like Christ and to seek that, then for eternity, I get closer and closer to God. And what a wonderful experience that would be. Does that, um, does that help understand where, where we're at yeah. and how we know if we're saved or not? Yes. Thank you. I have a question. <laughs> so with your, you were saying that once you, um, like when you get your name in the book of life and all of that. So once that happens though, and then you continue with your life and you fall from grace, does it get erased? Or how does, because that kind of turns that whole once saved, always saved thing. I, I definitely don't believe in that. And I've had very heavy conversations with my mom about that. But I don't know. It kind of, once you get your name written in the book of life, and then if you fall from grace, is it erased? Is it, what happens? Yeah. Well, first off, we have to remember, the book of life isn't a literal thing. There's not a book sitting around that God's going to open up and go, well, let me check the book and see if you're in there. Don't worry, I've updated. I got it on a PDF so I can so I can scroll for you guys really quickly, right? We have to remember most of the scripture, especially those things we see the book of life in Revelation. It's just metaphorical to kind of give us an idea. So it, it's, you know, whether we're in a relationship with him or not, that's what it means to be in the book of life. And so if we're not in a relationship, we're not. And if we are and, and we leave him, we're no longer in a relationship. We've severed that. So, yeah, if you were going to follow the analogy, yeah, your name is blotted out. And um, as Paul says in Hebrew says, you're worse off than you were before because you're not coming back. Which is also why for us, sanctification is so important. We press sanctification. I mean, just get holy in God. It's, it's, it's the difference in saying, yeah, I believe in God. I'm going to go about my life. And I believe in God. I'm going to make him my life. And that's, that's what we do here. Kind of almost feel like too, if you truly are saved and decide that you're going to make God your life, then you're not going to, in order to be truly saved, you're going to make the decision that for the rest of your life, you're going to go on the correct path. Like you were saying, on the correct momentum towards God, you're not going to make that detour and make something to fall from grace. Yeah. You're not and, and, yeah. That's a great way to, to look at it. And, and think about, as you said that, I was thinking, I mean, it's, it's like being married. I mean, they use that analogy to be married. I'm married to Trina, right? We got up there and we did the vows. Something happened. We became the same but different, right? It, it was there. Like, she became, she changed her name. I mean, whatever. I mean, she had a boring name. I, I give her a better one. It's cool. A couple of letters. It's king. I mean, anyway. <laughs> so, so things changed, but I'm, I'm moving in a relationship with her, right? We're in a relationship. But what happens if I say, yeah, I'm in a relationship with her, but I'm going to take a detour for a while. I mean, it's not a big deal. I'll come back to her later. And I take a detour in that relationship. What happens to that relationship? I mean, I've, I've, I've severed it permanently. I've ruined it. Yeah. It's not a small ordeal. And, and that's the same thing with God. I mean, if I'm in a relationship with her, I'm in a relationship with her. That's why Jesus is like, you better think clear, carefully before you follow me. This isn't some simple thing. I'm, I'm telling you, if you follow me, you, you, you don't... Um, you don't look back. It's, it's a tough path to do. And I tell people marriage is not easy. It's not. I mean, I make it easy, so it's easy for Trina. Being married to me is like the like, easiest thing you can do. <laughs> Probably a blessing every day. She wakes up, she's like, man, thank you, Lord, I'm married to him. 
Wow, really? You're not even going to try to hide that face, huh? <laughs> I was waiting for the facial expression. At first, she showed nothing, but I knew something was coming. Oh, that's good stuff. Right there. Yeah. But it is hard, right? It's, <laughs> yeah, drinks. Uh, but in the same thing with God, right? We work at it, and that's okay. That's all it is. It's just about working at it. It's not that hard to work on your relationship with God. Just like, honestly, it's not that hard to work on my relationship with Trina. It's really not. And if you love him, all the more easy. So, yeah, I think that whole I'm um, not taking a detour is, is a kind of a really good way to look at it. All right. Well, let's, um, let's finish there then. And we got chapter nine, so we're halfway through this book. And I feel really good about it. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for this opportunity again to gather, to discuss your word, to, um, to just kind of learn from each other, to, to push, to pull, to just use iron, to sharpen iron. And so guide us as we continue to do that. And Father, guide us as we continue to be faithful to you, to serve you, to love you, to move ever faster and strongly towards you, Lord, that we would that we would know you, that we would serve you, Father. We'd just be so enamored with you, Lord, that our eyes would be fixed upon Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith. So bless us, Father, as we worship you. Guide us in all that we do, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.